Hello friends, I recently did a video about Jacob Rees-Mogg and now in the interests of balance and all of us, here's one on Jeremy Corbyn. Not all evidence I present about Corbyn here is designed to be damning but informative and to build up a picture. We all have our own unique way of processing information and it's up to you to decide whether the information here is true, important and relevant and I would appreciate your feedback on my efforts. Jeremy Corbyn, pre-momentum. Jeremy Corbyn was born on the 26th of May 1949 in Chippenham, Wiltshire. He is the son of Naomi Loveday Corbyn, nay Josling, 1915 to 1987, and David Benjamin Corbyn, 1915 to 1986. He is the youngest of four sons, the others being Edward, the eldest, who apparently became a test pilot for Concorde, Andrew, the second eldest, a geologist who died in Papua New Guinea in 2001, and Piers, a weather forecaster and left-wing activist. It's reported that Jeremy's parents met in Conway Hall, Red Lion Square, London, while attending a rally against Franco. An article in The Guardian reads, Corbyn praised the radical traditions of the venue in Red Lion Square, to which he said he owed his existence. My parents met in this very hall, they were at a rally protesting about the fascist invasion of Spain. Cable Street is crucial. To me it has a deep personal significance. A mile away from where we stand today stood a young woman alongside thousands of local people, trade unionists, socialists, communists, Christians, Jews, Muslims, people of all and no faith. They stood here, and it was told to me in great detail, with one simple aim, to stop Oswald Mosley and his fascists marching through the East End. That woman was my mother. She stood here, along with so many others. She wanted to live in a world, as we all do, that's free from xenophobia and free from hate. Tatler magazine said, According to Rosa Prince, Corbyn's biographer, it was a thoroughly upper-middle-class scruffy country upbringing. His father, David, was an electrical engineer, and Naomi studied science at London University in the 30s, when women made up only 27% of students. They saw themselves as left-wing intellectuals. The house was full of books, says one school friend, and their backgrounds were in law and surveying. In outlook, they were like the webs, Beatrice and Sidney, who helped found the LSE, the New Statesman and the Fabian Society. David Corbyn worked a lot in the Soviet Union and even tried to learn Russian, but it was too hard. Nonetheless, Jeremy's less well-off childhood friends remember him as the boy who lived in the big house and went to a posh school with a posh uniform. He wasn't wrong about the big house. When Jeremy was seven, in about 1956, his father bought Yew Tree Manor, a 17th century farmhouse which was once part of the estate of the Duke of Sutherland. Corbyn's parents substituted the word manor for house to downgrade its grandness, a move which has since been reversed by its subsequent owners. He attended Castle House School, a fee-charging independent school in Newport, Shropshire, before graduating to nearby Adams Grammar School, a part boarding school. At school he became active in the Young Socialists, the Labour Party and the League Against Cruel Sports, but although active politically, he left grammar school having only achieved two E grades for A level. He joined the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament in 1966 while at school, and later, nearly 50 years later, became Vice Chairman. He spent a couple of years working for the NGO Voluntary Service Overseas in Jamaica before returning to the UK. Back in England, he was elected to Haringey Council in South Hornsey Ward in 1974, having been appointed to a role in a district health authority. He was a councillor in Haringey from 1974 until he became a Member of Parliament. He was first elected as an MP for the Labour Party in the Islington North constituency on the 9th of June 1983. Very shortly after entry into the Houses of Parliament, he started writing for the Morning Star newspaper, a newspaper set up in 1930 as the Daily Worker by the Communist Party of Great Britain, the name changing to the Morning Star in 1966. 
Corbyn still supports the Morning Star to this day. Ben Chaco was appointed editor of the Morning Star in May 2015. Previously, he had edited Challenge, the journal of the Young Communist League, and was a member of the Student Union Council at Oxford. At school in England, he learnt Mandarin, and later spent years in China as an adult. Upon hearing of Ben Chaco's appointment, Jeremy Corbyn said, The star is the most precious and only voice we have in the daily media. I look forward to working with Ben in promoting socialism and progress. In October 2017, Ben Chaco contributed this terrifying article to People's World. Russian Revolution at 100. Time to challenge capitalism again. As reported in The Telegraph and numerous other media outlets, MI5 and the Metropolitan Police's special branch opened files on Corbyn amid concerns over his IRA links, which you would think perfectly reasonable and responsible given his provably close connections to and public support for people who have been accused of conducting murderous bombing campaigns. After all, they would surely be blamed if they chose not to monitor him for political reasons, especially if it was found out that they could have stopped an attack. That's surely what the MI5's job is, to monitor domestic threats to national security. After all, in 1984, Corbyn and Ken Livingstone invited Gerry Adams, two convicted IRA volunteers, and other members of Sinn Féin to Westminster. This meeting took place only three weeks after the Brighton Hotel bombing, an attack on the Conservative Party leadership that killed five people. Sinn Féin today is also explicitly socialist. However, recent articles on this subject on the BBC, The Guardian and The Telegraph, for example, have all pointed the finger of blame at the intelligence agencies for breach of Corbyn's privacy, rather than pointing the finger at Corbyn for his connections to terrorists. But it's not just IRA bombings that he's concerned himself with. Corbyn has applied pressure in attempt to overturn the convictions of Jawad Botme and Samar Alami for the 1994 Israeli embassy bombing in London. They were convicted in 1996. Botme and Alami admitted having had possession of five pounds of explosives which were used to make the bombs, but denied that they had intended to use the materials in Britain. Alami said she had three handguns, and the explosives and guns were found in a lock-up she rented. He wrote numerous letters over a period of many years, appealing for their release from prison, and even wrote to the London Metropolitan University in 2013 in support of a bid by Botme to become a governor after his release from prison. That ended up going a little bit pear-shaped, though. Peculiarly, and highly uncharacteristically, lots of celebrities and celebrated charitable organisations were concerned that Botme and Alami were wrongfully convicted. I suggest what we have here, really, is a list of terrorists. Corbyn became the leader of the Labour Party in September 2015 following a leadership election against three fairly uninspiring other candidates, Yvette Cooper, Andy Burnham and Liz Kendall. Corbyn's leadership campaign was run by John Landsman and Simon Fletcher. Previous leader Ed Miliband had lost in the general election several months earlier and subsequently resigned, provoking a leadership contest. Corbyn won emphatically, with about 60% of the members' votes, despite receiving the lowest number of nominations from fellow MPs, 35 these MPs included Diane Abbott, Joe Cox, Sadiq Khan, David Lammy, Dennis Skinner and John MacDonald. Momentum was launched on October the 8th, 2015, Corbyn having become Labour leader on the 12th of September, three and a half weeks earlier. Its founding has been credited to four people, John Landsman, James Schneider, Adam Klug and Emma Rees. The leader of this group is John Landsman, who became the first Momentum chair. He is described on Wikipedia as being brought up in an Orthodox Jewish family in Southgate, North London. In an interview with the Jewish Chronicle, Landsman is reported to have said, I was involved from the very beginning. I wanted to have a candidate from the left, and I was actively encouraging people to stand. Various other people had declined, and I eventually settled upon Jeremy as someone I wanted to persuade to stand. So here we have it. 
John Landsman, someone who comes from an extremely wealthy Orthodox Jewish family, was actually involved in the recruitment of Jeremy Corbyn to be the hard left candidate that he wanted. I want to read what I think is an uncommonly fantastic article in The Telegraph by Andrew Gilligan, who really didn't hold back describing John Landsman's business connections. The director of Momentum, the controversial Jeremy Corbyn supporters group, is closely linked to a web of property companies, some of them offshore, used for tax avoidance and community asset stripping. John Landsman, 58, a self-described veteran Benite, runs a long-standing hard-left website, Left Futures, which campaigns against fat cat tax dodgers and asset-stripping private equity bosses in this no-holds-barred era of crooked capitalism. Left Futures is based in the Soho offices of Foundation Property and Capital, FPC, run by Mr Landsman's brother, Stephen, and son, Ben. It specialises in creating small co-investment vehicles for high net worth investors, allowing them to shelter income tax, working in conjunction with a leading private equity firm. Ben is a director of Autonovo Holdings, also based at FPC, which owns Left Futures. On behalf of wealthy clients, FPC buys undervalued community assets, such as pubs and hostels for the homeless, which are typically closed and their tenants evicted by FPC or the vendor. The buildings are then converted into housing or more profitable retail. FPC describes itself as unashamedly opportunistic. At the Blue Lion in Harmon's Waters, Barks, Trevor Cook had been landlord for 12 years and lived above the bar when he was made redundant and given three weeks to leave. The pub was sold to FPC by the Stonegate Pub Company. Mr Cook told a local newspaper the closure was a bit of a bombshell after a record week in which the pub had made more money than we've ever made before, he said. I don't understand the need for speed. This pub has been my life. Being a landlord isn't a job, it's a lifestyle. Now I've got two weeks left to find a new job and somewhere to live. I'm probably going to have to do some sofa surfing. FPC was denied permission to turn the pub into homes and a convenience store, but is appealing. At the Heroes of Lucknow pub in Aldershot, Hants, landlords Sylvia and Brian Calpilla were thrown out after 26 years. Mrs Calpilla said, The deal was all done behind our backs. We were first told we had three months to get out once it had been purchased. They asked us to stay on a temporary lease, and we did. Then they asked if we would be willing to get out within a month if offered some money, so we said yes. Because it was a verbal contract, we never got anything. In a sense, I'm quite relieved we've left because things were getting very hard, our hands were full, but it was our family home. The pub is now a convenience store. On Canvey Island, Essex, FPC bought and closed the King Canute pub, so named after it was one of the few buildings not affected by the devastating 1953 North Sea floods. Locals still remember being rescued by troops operating from the pub, FPC rebuffed a 400 signature petition from residents asking for the landmark to be reopened. It wants to build housing in the grounds. FPC has also been involved in the sale of several homeless hostels, including Castle Lane in Victoria, London, which went to the development giant Land Securities for £22.5 million. Westminster housing officials said the hostel had had considerable success in working with rough sleepers and its closure resulted in a gap in service provision with a loss of 170 beds. Other London homeless hostels sold, described by FPC as redundant and monolithic, included seven dock streets near Aldgate, sold for around £10 million and now used by backpackers. Princess Beatrice House in Earl's Court which became student accommodation in a £15 million deal, and Judd House near Old Street Roundabout, which has been turned into 20 warehouse-style apartments for affordable and market rent. FPC promotes itself to investors as a means of avoiding tax. Publicity for its convenience store's income and growth-limited partnership, seen by the Sunday Telegraph, states it offers tax efficiency with substantial capital allowances which should shelter income tax for the first two years of investment. FPC is held through a complex network of more than 40 companies and partnerships, mostly in the UK, but some offshore. 
Most of FPC's operations are in the UK, but the company's main funds do not appear to be held in Britain. None of the UK companies which has reported accounts contain substantial sums, and those which have filed to do so as small companies. Part of FPC's property portfolio is held under offshore mortgages and other arrangements with Foundation Property and Capital SARL, a sister firm in the tax haven of Luxembourg. Directors there include Mark Pearson and William Oliver, senior managers in the giant Forum Partners private equity company. FPC declined to answer when asked if it or its clients avoided tax by using a shell company in Luxembourg. There is no suggestion that FPC or its clients have done anything illegal. Left Futures, John Landsman's website, rails against the murky influence of Tory money on British politics via such devices as family trusts, non-DOM arrangements and offshore mortgages. It attacks letterbox companies that are used to route profits through countries such as the Netherlands and Luxembourg to take advantage of favourable tax treaties, condemning them as arcane devices to defeat tax justice for the world's other 99.9999%. One London Labour MP said John Lansman's followers are going around trying to undermine decent Labour MPs like Stella Creasy who have actually achieved things for the poor. Meanwhile, while preaching hard left righteousness, he is tied in with a company that appears to profit from the asset stripping of community facilities such as pubs and homeless hostels. It is hypocritical to say the least. Mr Landsman, a veteran of 1980s hard left faction fighting, was key to Mr Corbyn's successful leadership bid and is sole director of Momentum Campaign Limited, based at his £1 million flat in Butler's Wharf, Shad Thames, next to the capital's Tower Bridge. He created momentum to continue the energy and enthusiasm of Jeremy's campaign and insists it is not about deselecting moderates. However, the group has been described as aggressive and a rabble by members of the Shadow Cabinet and several momentum activists appear to substantiate fears by moderate Labour MPs that it is targeting them. John Lansman said last night that he supported his brother and son FPC is an entirely ethical company. I have absolute confidence in that. Neither my brother or my son have anything to do with any of my political activities, he said. John Landsman and FPC declined to comment further. James Schneider is another extremely wealthy Jew who was involved in momentum from the very outset. He is the son of Brian Schneider, who was chief executive of property company OEM PLC before his death in 2004, and Tessa Lang, a London-based property consultant. About one year after Brian Schneider died, OEM sued his widow, Mrs. Theresa Ann Schneider, and an alleged mistress of Mr. Schneider, Miss Schuffler Lobock. Reading from the court documents, it is claimed by the claimant that between 1997 and 11th of March 2004, Mr Schneider fraudulently, wrongfully and in breach of his duties stole a sum in excess of £5 million from the claimant. That is a large amount. It represents a removal of in excess of £500,000 per annum, which went undetected for seven years. To show the significance of the figure, the amount removed equaled or exceeded the net annual profits of the claimant for each year. It stated later, The simple fact, whichever way the second defendant puts it, is that £5 million has been removed from the claimant's bank account. The remaining two people credited with being founders of Momentum are Adam Klug and Emma Rees. Michael Segalov of Huck magazine reported on Thursday 9th of November 2017. Once it became clear that Corbyn was set to become Labour's next leader, Adam and Emma met with long-standing Labour left-winger John Landsman and James Schneider, now Corbyn's head of strategic communications. Landsman had always planned on setting up a new organisation after the campaign was over, but with odds of 200 to 1 of a Corbyn victory at the outset, the size and scale of what would soon be formed was nothing like he could have expected. Soon plans for the formation of momentum were underway. In early 2015, both Adam Clug and Emma Rees are reported to have had teaching jobs. 
They both resigned from Momentum during 2017. They travelled to Canada with Bernie Sanders activist Becky Bond because, as they write in their joint article in the Globe and Mail, we believe Canada is ripe for a Sanders-Corbyn-style insurgency. We believe that a surge on the left in Canada is just waiting to happen, and we're here to help it along. In Canada, a political manifesto entitled LEAP was presented to political parties during the 2015 general election, with the support of numerous celebrities, organisations and corporations, and although it hasn't been officially adopted by any political parties yet, it's likely that the new leader of the New Democratic Party, Jagmeet Singh, will adopt the manifesto in the near future. Who wrote it, you might ask? Well, this is the top question on the FAQs on their website, and it irritatingly states in answer. The writings of the Leap Manifesto were initiated in the spring of 2015 at a two-day meeting in Toronto attended by 60 representatives from Canada's Indigenous Rights, Social and Food Justice, Environmental, Faith-Based and Labour movements. The This Changes Everything team convened the meeting but did not determine any outcomes. The idea was to create a space to not just say no to the worst attacks on human rights and environmental standards, but to dream together about the world we actually want and how we could get there. The manifesto went through several drafts and was shaped by the contributions of dozens of people. In other words, they're not going to tell us. Help for momentum has also come from overseas. A former director of Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign, Erika Oiterhoven, is one of the Sanders team now helping out with the momentum campaign. The Guardian reports, drafting in members of the Sanders team who know something about rallying support for an outside candidate, deemed too radical for the mainstream, has been a vital part of putting the impressive volunteer army to best use. And concerning Erica specifically, she is helping Momentum mobilise what would otherwise be an overwhelming number of people, and together they have implemented technology never before used in a UK general election campaign. Simon Fletcher is another person who was crucial to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership campaign. He was Chief of Staff under Ken Livingstone when he was the Mayor of London, and he became Jeremy Corbyn's Chief of Staff after Jeremy Corbyn became Labour leader. As Mayor, Ken Livingstone has almost total power to do exactly as he wishes in certain specific areas. As Chair of Transport for London, it is Ken Livingstone who has the final say over the running of the capital's buses, trains and road network. As the guiding force behind the London Development Agency, he controls which parts of London are regenerated. With a budget of £10 billion paid by taxpayers not just in London, but from all over Britain, and a City Hall staff of 732, his position is unique in British public life. There's no doubt that the power within the Greater London Authority, this new government for London, lies absolutely and explicitly with the Mayor, and it was intended to. Although approved by the Assembly, the Mayor has the power to appoint a coterie of unelected advisers. The salaries of Livingstone's inner circle cost us over £1 million a year, and they are accountable directly to the Mayor. Let me introduce you to a few of this group. John Ross, the Mayor's Director of Economic and Business Policy. Simon Fletcher, Chief of Staff. Mark Watts, Policy Advisor on Climate Change, and Redmond O'Neill, Director of Public Affairs and Transport. Livingston's team is a close-knit group of old comrades. He has personally told me he can rely on them completely. I think there's no question that the team that Ken Livingston built around him, which others have called the Kenocracy, uh, was very much based on people who'd worked with him before he became mayor. They go way, way back with him. He's sort of grown up politically with them, and they stick together, and they, they close ranks around him. They seem to have come to some, from some sort of left of Marxist uh, background, um, and they, f they form a coterie which is impenetrable. The mayor's key advisers, Redmond O'Neill, John Ross, Simon Fletcher and Mark Watts, are all former members of a left-wing organisation called Socialist Action. The mayor's economic advisor, John Ross, who used to work for the Russian Communist Party, was Socialist Action's leader. He was quoted as saying, 
The ruling class must know that they will be killed if they do not allow a takeover by the workers. If we aren't armed, there will be a bloodbath. The group met in this building in the 1980s and 90s and printed its magazine from here. Mark Wadsworth worked closely with Ken Livingstone on the left of the Labour Party at the time and was constantly in contact with Socialist Action and its members. Socialist Action, as I understand it, described themselves as the British representatives of the um, communist Fourth International uh, based in Moscow. Um, and uh, so I guess they would see themselves as the inheritors of the old uh, international Marxist group Mantle. John Ross told me he was the leader of Socialist Action, Redmond O'Neill, his deputy. And I knew others, uh, Anne Kane, Simon Fletcher. Um, these were familiar names and faces. When electors vote for Ken Livingston, they are voting for someone who is hugely influenced by Socialist Action. Simon Fletcher, like Adam Clark and Emma Rees, resigned from Momentum in 2017 to campaign for socialism elsewhere, in Fletcher's case, Scotland, to work with Richard Leonard, who has seemingly been chosen to play the Sanders-Corbyn role up north. Seamus Milne is another that Jeremy Corbyn has by his side as Director of Strategy and Communications, a hard-left elitist and son of former BBC Director General Alastair Milne, Seamus Milne has been a very wealthy far-left establishment activist for his whole life. He is good friends with Andrew Murray, another recent addition to the Corbyn team. Murray, who has spent decades as a member of explicitly communist political parties, namely the Communist Party of Britain and the Communist Party of Great Britain, is now one of Corbyn's special political advisers. Murray also came from a very wealthy establishment family. His father was a stockbroker and Slane's pursuivant, Peter Drummond Murray, and his maternal grandfather was actually the governor of the Madras Presidency of British India from 1940 to 1946. Then there was the now infamous meeting that Jeremy Corbyn had with radical Jewish communist group Judas, which has a rapidly increasing Facebook following, currently standing at about 11,000 people. Judas have been wholeheartedly, unwaveringly, even fanatically supporting Corbyn, which indicates to me that they know that he is their man and that it's in their interests to promote him. Judas, despite its childish, informal and rude character, is a serious organisation connected to mainstream Judaism demonstrated by a 2011 letter they wrote in support of the Occupy London movement, which was signed by 11 rabbis. And as we have already discovered, it was an Orthodox Jewish man, John Landsman, who persuaded Corbyn to stand in the first place, founded Momentum, and founded the company now known as Jeremy for Labour Limited. Judas's Heroes list also makes for interesting reading. Thanks for watching. I won't be voting for anyone in the next election. I don't believe we're going to get the revolution we want from within the current system, and I think it requires thinking outside of the box. A low turnout will be the first step towards a true evolution, away from the safety of government control, and into a life of personal responsibility, individual freedom and community. It must be possible. God bless you.